Something that is quite amazing on today's, in today's world is that one in two employees have left a job to get away from a manager and improve their overall life at some point of their career. And these are some numbers that Gallup put away based on the state of the American manager report. And they also say something that is quite interesting. It is that managers account for at least 70% of the variances in employee engagement scores. This is quite important and, and quite relevant for the, in today's world because we are really living a time of change where everything is on the table to make the workplace better for employees. And I really want to understand how to handle a toxic manager and what is the root cause of displaying these toxic behaviors. So the good news is that I got hold of Eric Bailey. And Eric Bailey is the best-selling author of a book that is quite provocative, I must say, in terms of its uh, title, is The Cure for Stupidity, Using Brain Science to Explain Irrational Behaviors. So Eric is the president of Bailey Strategic Innovation Group. So it's a, it's a group basically working on human communication consulting for firms. I mean, we can name a couple of them, like the famous Google, the US Air Force, <laughs> and a couple of governmental organizations and international corporations. Eric is the creator of the principles of human understanding, a leadership and communication methodology based in brain science and psychology. And of course, he has studied about organizational development and leadership. But I have the impression that this is not really the reason why his focus today is in helping leaders to communicate better and display less of these toxic behaviors. Eric, welcome to the episode. And I wanted really to understand what is the personal reason why you got so much interested in leadership and toxic behaviors? Thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, so it's it's interesting. So when I started my my kind of my career, um, I realized that the way in which uh, a leader or a manager or a supervisor engages with the 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 employee can fundamentally change the the trajectory of that employee's um, uh, uh, tenure. So so for example, the very first time this became real to me, uh, I was just I was it's still in college. I was maybe maybe 20 years old. And um, uh, I got my first offer to be a manager. This was at a concessions company popping kettle corn at the Phoenix Zoo. <laughs> and and uh, the the gentleman, Scott Grandin, who owned the company, he said, you know, I think you could be management material. Why don't you why don't you come and shadow with me for a while and see if this is something you want to do? And uh, one, you know, I'm walking around with him. We're doing inventory. We're checking on things, and uh, we realized that one of our employees was late in the morning, and uh, he got a call from her. And you know, in my experience, when an employee is late, like you're supposed to yell at them and you know chew them out. You're supposed to like make them feel it, so they never they're never late again. You're giving that negative experience, so they never want to do that again. And he answered the phone and he says, "Hey, are you okay?" His first reaction was, "Are you okay?" And she was thrown by that. And she's like, uh, yeah, I, I'm fine. I'm on my way, you know. And she starts giving all the excuses like an employee normally does. Hey, I'm just glad you're okay. I'll see you when you get here. And he hung up. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, you're supposed to like, you're supposed to bring the hammer down and all these things. Like, well, here's the thing. She's already stressed out that she's late. This is her first time ever being late. And if I, if I, treat her that in a, in a way that she's going to need to feel it, you know, with quotation marks, feel it, she's going to have a negative experience about this. Or I can treat her with, I'm surprised that you're late because this is so out of character for you. My main concern is your safety and your well-being. Like she's already going to be kind of bring, ring, running herself through the, her own ringer. I don't need to add to that. But if I welcome her, she's never going to forget that. And, and, and that is more likely to make her want to be on time is because of the kindness I showed her rather than the anger. And that, I mean, it stuck with her, it stuck with me. Um, and, and I realized that a leader or a manager who treats someone in a different way than, than people expect, uh, or not, not as punitive, but rather with caring 
you can fundamentally change that employee's trajectory. That employee was never, ever late again. Uh, that employee gave extra effort because she wanted to make him happy because he was making her happy. And, and that is something that's really stuck deep into my core. And I've always thought about how can we learn more about that? What is amazing is that we have been, I mean, our brain is so full of these norms made by society that we need, if you are a leader, you need to be decisive, kind of aggressive in order to impose order and chaos. So mm -hmm. our brain is al almost formatted and the expectation was right. You were young, so you were expecting a behavior that was a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And we all expect that and only when we see the first example of a leader doing the right thing, having a little bit of kind of understanding of the psychological stress that we put in people, that how we react in moments of fear. Uh, this is the moment where we start changing. But unfortunately, we have been formatted by centuries and centuries of history telling us a leader has to be strong. Now, I wanted to come back to a more recent event. So during COVID, there was a moment kind of panic in many organizations as managers couldn't cope with the need of this agility, adaptation to change. Uh, they couldn't manage remote teams. They, cannot, they couldn't empathize. In fact, with them, they didn't know what to do. Some of them, they were scared of calling the, the direct reports but they, because they didn't know how to interact with Zoom. Um, so, and it was during a time of, of change where people were completely stressed. I remember a KPMG report mentioning that the top worry for a, a, a CEO was that he recognized that during COVID, they, they didn't have the, they were not equipped with the right skill, the soft skills in order to lead uh, to, during these times. So from a psychological perspective, perspective, why managers really suck at adapting to change? Well, so psychologically, our brains uh, have too much information to process at any, any one given second. There, there's there literally they, they've done studies and about 99.99995% of the information that comes to our brain, we do not have the capacity to process. And so uh, whenever possible, our brains like to uh, routinize things. We like to uh, get things out of our active thinking and move it to our passive thinking. We want to get things to as, as predictable as possible. And that's what our brains love to do. I mean, you're driving and you love taking the same route to work. You don't want to deviate from that route. Or if you're driving near work on your day off, you get off on the same exit for work and you're like, oops, oh, sorry. You know, because your brain just loves to drop things into that regular, regular memory. And so when things change, our brains actually have a natural aversion to that change because that requires more thinking. It requires extraneous thought. Like we have to really do more in those situations. And so when in a management situation, in many cases, a large percentage of the leaders in our organizations across the world are ill-equipped to lead. They're not given the proper tools or skills or, 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 or background or context to do leadership. So what they do is they get in on, on the things that they can do well. They focus on the areas that they can keep things in control. And then anything outside of that is difficult. And so when, you know, all of a sudden there's this, this big thing that happens where all of these managers across the world are required to do extra. Uh, you have to focus on people's well-being. You have to focus on things outside of work. Um, because that's outside of what folks are used to or what they're good at, it becomes a stressful situation and people want to avoid the stress. And so we see a lot of managers avoiding that, pushing against that. This is a waste of time. You see a lot of a lot of managers, you know, as as kind of the, the COVID progression went, pushing quickly to get back into the office. Let's get back to the situation I'm used to because that's where it's more comfortable for me. And so you know, psychologically, there's nothing wrong with that. That is just, that is the way our brains naturally work. But what it indicates to us is that those managers that are better able to adapt to new environments or better able to adapt to new contexts, they are the ones that are going to be more successful in the future. Mm. Two things that I, I take out of what you say. So first, you made me think about 
uh, the concept of being an autopilot, which is a concept, in fact, that comes from one of your customers. Google is doing this training about search inside yourself. And this is where I learned the, the, the word autopilot, to be an autopilot. So we, we are flooded with so much information the day to day, and it is our, our better state to, to keep on with the flow instead of understanding, capturing new new emotions, understanding the, uh, the other. Um, and probably this, the second thing uh, that you mentioned is about, you say that it is more about uh, people do not, uh, people who are more into the comfort of staying on the same situation, but, it, but it's our brain, in fact. I, I know that you meant the, the, our brain is not made to, to change, in fact. Our brain is the one who will give you this, we believe that are rational thing, rational justifications of why we don't do things, but in fact, it's the BS that we are telling to each other that our brain does in order to avoid change because change is, I mean, when there is fear about the, the future, it's, it's almost like protection for, for us. Yes. Back in the day, yes. it was about escaping the animal who will, who will eat us. And today is anything that changes, then there is our hormones of change that displays fear and then we want to escape the, the, the news doing the, what we must do. Absolutely. Now, I want to be a little bit more fair uh, in this case. So is it fair to pull out, to put all of the fault on the poor overloaded managers? Or should we look bigger? Should we look at the senior management team that allows the spread of toxic behaviors? Huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that 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 we talk about all the time in our work is that there is never, mm, I don't want to say never, uh, there is very infrequently a single source to big issues. So if we're dealing with a lot of big issues uh, in an organization, there are likely many different source points. So it can be uh, em 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 employee attitudes, it can be management skills, it can be senior leadership culture, it can be procedures, it can be environment. There are so many things that are so interconnected. And, and one of the things he talks specifically about toxic behavior, Talk, so, so when I think about this idea, I think about you know, the, the culture of an organization, which in, in my definition is the standards, the attitudes, the beliefs of the people in the culture. Yeah. And so and so when you think about that, culture is defined by the people in the culture, which is everyone up and down, left and right in the organization. And so as as things happen. Uh, and I want you to think about like um, uh, uh, birthday celebrations. So in, in one organization, their birthday culture is you put on a, 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 a hat, like a cone hat, and everyone, you know, sings around a cake, right? That might be the culture. Yeah. Uh, another culture, it might be, you know, um, uh, you, you, know you take the little uh, stress balls and you throw them at the person. I don't know, right? <laughs> Every organization has their own culture. Yeah. And what, what, what we do is typically, again, trying to keep things the same, is we get into a culture, we acculturate, meaning we match, that culture changes us into fitting the culture and then we just perpetuate the culture ongoing instead of stopping and saying why do we do it this way maybe we should adjust the culture and kind of we change the culture which is which is very rare so when you talk about toxic cultures or toxic behaviors what we have is we have an environment where people up and down continue to allow toxic behavior and, and, and a lot of people will say, yeah, Eric, but, but the employee can't do anything if the senior manager is exhibiting that behavior. That is a fool's thinking, right? The, fo the fool's idea is that I can't do anything about it because uh, another mentor of mine, uh, Randy Courier, he's a PhD psychologist. Uh, he taught me everything I know about organizational development. He said, we promote what we tolerate. And, and that is something... A lot of people don't understand that is if I see someone b behaving in a toxic way and I observe that behavior and I tolerate that behavior to that person doing the behavior, they will look at me and say, oh, you've got nothing wrong with this. 
cool, I'm going to keep going. And they will continue to perpetuate that behavior. And so, yes, I do believe that it is it is incumbent upon uh, a manager to learn how to, to mitigate these toxic behaviors, learn about these toxic behaviors. I do believe it is uh, uh, incumbent upon the senior leadership to not exhibit these behaviors or things that can lead to these behaviors uh, and not allow these toxic behaviors up and down the organization, I believe is also incumbent upon staff to not stand for toxic behaviors. And in that case, it could be it could mean saying something which causes a lot of fear. It could mean leaving. It could mean you know what we're seeing a lot now, which is the, you know quote unquote quiet quitting. Right? There's a lot of things that can be done up and down the organization, and the fault does not lie in any one area. <laughs> That is quite powerful. Uh, <laughs> you made me think, in fact, that until today, the discussion about culture, so the solution for amending culture was often like, let's do a training. The funny right. thing is that training doesn't solve the issue. That, <laughs> it doesn't. Imagine, you, and you mentioned that these little examples about throwing the ball or the, or the cake for the anniversary. So a culture is like being in a family. In a family, we have really kind of stupid rituals and ritual <laughs> is what make us belonging that we we feel connected with with people so it is not about trainings it is more about how do we create this set of mindset and behaviors that together are going to and you really don't need to train people because a lot of things are common sense so the feeling of belonging to of, be, of being a family i mean already by doing this twerky uh, rituals you start mm -hmm. already by giving recognition to people like saying thank right. you from uh, promoting fairness in the in the organization being able to speak up i mean th this is you don't need a slice you don't need a trainer for that right, right. yeah yeah one, one of the things that, that we see all the time and, and this is uh, was just difficult because our business, we we are a training business. We do a lot of training. Um, but but if you've ever seen someone exhibit the desired behavior, then training is not required, mm. right? They already know how to do it. So training isn't what's necessary. And so, okay, then, then, what, then what do you do as a leader? Well, what you have to do is you have to identify why that behavior is not being exhibited more regularly. What is the context around them that is not giving them the clear pathway to exhibiting that behavior regularly? What are the habits that need to be developed to exhibit that behavior regularly? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's culture. That's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Now, I wanted to, to, to take a little bit of inspiration from your from your book so the book the cure for stupidity using brain science to explain irrational behavior at work in this book you describe the principles of human understanding as a toolbox mm -hmm. to understand behaviors decision and motivation so what are what do you think are the principles that explain the most frequent toxic behaviors in managers because i saw a couple but i want to have your your <laughs> opinion on that yeah, so so there are there are there are several. Um, uh, the 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 ones that are the foundational ones uh, that we see is uh, this idea of the illusion of certainty. This is actually the fir the first. So there are twenty two principles, mm -hmm. and the first one is called the illusion of certainty. And basically, the illusion of certainty is this idea that our brains like to project certainty into the world, even if there is none. So, uh, for example, a, a manager will be asked a question, and let's say the an the manager does not know exactly the answer. Well, what will happen is the illusion, of the illusion of certainty will kick in and will make that manager believe that their answer is the answer. Like not only an answer, but the answer. And so uh, they'll say, yeah, it's this. And with 100% confidence, right? But they may be wrong. And we the manager will make things up all the time because they believe that they're supposed to know because they're intelligent. They are required to have the answers. Mm -hmm. And what we see here over and over, and a lot of these toxic behaviors come from this idea that managers are unwilling to acknowledge a mistake. They're unwilling to apologize for an error. They are unwilling to, right, to, to, to do all or say, I don't know. All these things reinforce these, these ideas that I am the ultimate authority. And, and that is one of the biggest toxic behaviors that we see all the time. So this illusion of certainty, for example, um, and this, this plays out for everybody, not just managers, but 
you know, uh, you say, hey, when are you going to get a report back to me? And they say, oh, uh, I'll get it to you a week from Tuesday. And then they may they fail to meet their own self-imposed deadline. That's the illusion of certainty or, or the, all those sorts of things. They, they play out so often. Like you will likely never hear a manager in your organization say, I'm sorry. You'll never hear a manager. You're unlikely to hear a manager in your organization say, I don't know. Right. And all of these, which actually build vulnerability and trust, uh, those hold back this idea that I know, I know everything. I can never be wrong, which obviously means you're going to be wrong all the time. Um, and, 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 it, and it prevents that, that deep connection. And so that's the, that's the first principle that we see. And I'm, I'm telling you, everybody, everybody deals with this illusion of certainty. And, and it's, you know, we do a lot of, a lot of, uh, exercises to help illustrate this, you know, through the book and then through my workshops, but, I have this one, I'm not going to describe the exercise too much, but I'll give you the, 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 the survey results or the results of it. So I asked people you know, a very, a relatively simple counting question, like go ahead and count these things. I put something up on a slide and I asked people to count. And then I say, okay, you, you know how, what is your count and how confident are you that you have the right answer? And I would say on average, 90% to 95% of people say that they are eight, nine or 10 out of 10 in confidence, very high in confidence. And then less than 2% of the people get it right. Now, I've I've literally asked this question to well over 40,000 people around the world. And the results are the same. It's because obviously there's a trick in it and, and people don't, they can't perceive the trick. But everyone believes that they have the right answer. And in, in one situation, I'll, I'll do, I'll, you know, you've got options and it's, you know, you have to count these things. And it's somewhere between four and 13. And that, I give a multiple choice. And in a group of 200 people, on average, I will have at least one person choosing four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. Every possible of the multiple choice is selected in a group of 200 people, right? And it's and everyone believes they have the right answer. And that is something that's like, oh, there is something to our human nature that leads us down the down these paths, and that's that's the thing that really clicked for me. So the so first one, the illusion of certainty. The second one is actually a lot more relatable to folks because uh, we we see it pop up in more situations. Called perception is more important than reality. So so drawing this the distinction between perception or the way we interpret things and reality, the way things actually exist, yeah. right? Those are not the same thing. Perception and reality. And if you've ever met someone who's colorblind or uh, you ever met anyone who has any kind of different ability, you would see like, oh, we perceive things differently. Well, what happens if you're next to somebody and you're looking at an image? Maybe it's an optical illusion. Maybe it's, I don't know if you remember seeing the uh, the dress, the blue and black or white and gold dress of 2015, yeah. right? Yeah. And people are looking at this thing. How are we looking at the same thing and perceiving two different things, right? And, and, and that is something that a lot of leaders don't understand is in their mind, they have said something clearly. I've communicated something very well. I've, I've explained my, uh, my, ex, uh, uh, my expectations, but Ooh. the employee hears something completely different, right? It's perception is more important than reality. So whatever the employee perceives is what they're going to do. It's not what the manager says. It's what the employee perceives. And in this case, Right. If the employee is going to behave based on their perception, then it is critically important for the manager to learn that perception and communicate well to that perception. Right. It's not about so what managers will typically do is say, oh, there's something wrong with you. You heard me wrong. Yeah, that's not how communication works. Right. Communication happens not just when the message is sent but it actually happens when the message is received. And so the reception of the message is more important than the sending of the message. And that is a foundation that all leaders need to understand. And this is why leadership is so difficult is because if you manage a team of 40 people, there are 40 different ways your message is going to be received. And so as a manager, you need to modulate your communication and your expectation delivery and all of these things to make sure that your message is being received accurately and appropriately. And that's why management is so hard. And that's why so many people are bad at it. Indeed. Now, what you're saying makes me think about something that I read once upon a time. I don't even remember the source anymore. 
So there was a study that showed that the level of self-awareness in uh, leadership is worse the more you go up the ladder. So mm -hmm. it's almost like you are less aware about either your biases or your strengths or your weaknesses. It's you you become worse like in your soft skills in in what should be the core of your of your <laughs> job. So is does it mean that in order to solve all these um, all the basic problems of leadership and toxic uh, behaviors, we need to work on the core, which is getting to know ourselves and getting to know all all these biases or or thoughts or or place of our brain that, that, that our brain is is doing, so that we should be able to acknowledge it in order to be aware of what what is happening with us and to be a better leader. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and that's that's the reason that I wrote the book. So so it's called The Cure for Stupidity and 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 people love the title, but what they're thinking is, you know, I see, you know, st stupid decisions everywhere. I see people make mistakes everywhere and and I need to be able to fix them. But the the kind of the underlying premise of the book is if you understand the brain science, the psychology, the linguistics, the anthropology, uh, the, 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 all the stuff is underneath mm. their behavior, you probably wouldn't judge them as stupid any longer. If you understood why someone is reacting the way that they would, then you wouldn't judge them as stupid anymore. And that's, and that's the real lesson for leaders. It's, it's not about curing people. But it's learning about how our brains work, how your brain works, and and how we interact with each other, and and all the friction points therein, and how can we learn to change our perception of these behaviors instead of saying, "Oh my God, you're so irrational because you don't agree with me." Instead, say something like, "You believe that you are perfectly rational and logical." Hmm. What about your experience and your world and your context and your history makes you believe that? Hmm. Oh, and that makes me curious. And so, yeah, it is about awareness. We do have to learn how to understand how our brains work as far as judgment and criticism, because hmm. that's a big part of it. We also have to learn how their brains work. And so it's there is like a two layer process. We have to get self-aware. And once we're there, then we become we become other aware, and that kind of that, that dual plane really makes the world a lot broader. And you see people like, oh, we may disagree about something, but we can still communicate as humans. And that we don't need to fight about it, we don't need to debate about it. I don't need to prove that you're wrong. I don't need to prove that I'm right. I don't need to prove that you're dumb or that I'm smart. There's nothing that's necessary there. Oh, I can just engage with you as a human. And, and that, that thing, engaging as a human, giving that person the feeling of being seen and understood that they belong, that changes everything. It changes the relationship on an acute level, but it starts to change the culture on a broad level. And that's, that's really the impact of all this work. Huh. Now, I want to move away from, okay, so we accept no i want to get back to something that you say <laughs> you just say that um there is a lot of knowledge that could complement and make a, a a leader more intuitive on the person they are but i have the impression that today like if we compare 10 years ago it was super difficult to find good literature that was accessible to normal people <laughs> Uh, about human behavior and in the last 10 years they, there is so much so many books that we can we cannot even classify as self-development like 10 years ago because self-development 10 years ago it was a little bit a mix of fluff and uh, or it was too much academical suddenly there is authors like like you who make it accessible because you are not going to talk about really all the depth of psychology you are talking about the real behavior, so something that we relate and we understand, that even if we have no clue about the psychology, but you are trying to explain it, uh, explain it in, in an easier manner. So this is accessible. So 
Leaders do not have to believe that they need to be equipped with a degree of psychology to be better leaders because today there is accessible books, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's it's really interesting uh that that a lot of that kind of the whole like nonfiction uh, uh leadership development genre is exploding because uh and I, I honestly I I lean very heavily on uh, the, uh TED. So so the TED Talks. Yes. So because of uh Brene Brown uh and Simon Sinek uh, th- those are probably the two that sparked this kind of this renaissance uh, of, of of leadership development uh, and and human development. I, and I understand it's been around for a long time, and and it's had its. I, I'm I'm a nerd in this space, and I've been reading books since I was little. I mean, I remember I remember reading How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, when I was in high school, and that book was published in the 1930s, right? Yeah. And so. I understand it's been a genre for a long time, but I think because of Brene Brown and Simon Sinek, it, it really sparked, which are the, the two most watched, you know, some of the most watched TED Talks of all time. Yeah. Uh, they sparked this kind of new new wave of self-exploration and understanding how we actually engage. Because if you think about it, we have been suppressing a lot of the, the, the feelings, the emotions, the reactions to toxic behavior for decades. I mean, people have been just deal, just shut up and deal with it, right? That's that's kind of been the the ethos over the last, you know, yeah, hundred years or so, more more than hundred years, and and so now I think what's happening, especially with COVID, uh, I think a lot more folks are just realizing that they can talk about these things, right? I've got uh, a, a buddy of mine uh, named Jeff Harry, and he has an amazing workshop called "Dudes Do Better," talking about toxic masculinity. And that is not something that would have been a sought after program, what, five, 10 years ago. But because we've entered this space where we're open to expressing, right? We're open to expressing what we're experiencing, what we might not know. And this kind of the space of curiosity is really transformed, I believe, the kind of the leadership industry. And I think that what's going to happen is as more folks start to learn about this work, the folks that choose not to learn about this work are going to be pushed out. It's going to be it's going to be obvious that they are so incapable of leadership. And and I want to draw the distinction between manager, which is a, a title, uh, versus a leader, which is in my definition someone who has a follower. Right. So as soon as someone chooses to follow you uh, off of the path that you are uh, currently taking, that makes you a leader. So so for example, I mean. Let's say there's a, a parade going down Main Street, and it's someone from the crowd just runs in and and walks at the front of the parade. Like you're not a leader because yeah. the parade was already going that direction, right? But <laughs> but if if you if you can take a group of people and they choose they choose to follow you, right, in a direction that makes you a leader. So there's nothing that you have that makes you a leader. All of the power lies in the followers. So if they choose to follow you you then become a leader. If they choose to not follow you, you are no longer a leader. And that's something that a lot of folks don't understand. It's like, well, I'm I'm the boss now, so le- I'm a leader. Like, no, you are not a leader. You're a boss. And that's fine. There's a distinction. And, and both are necessary things. But understanding that leadership is so much more than just a title. And the folks that are, are spending the time doing this self-awareness work, doing this development work, over time, they're going to be head and shoulders above everybody else, right? The folks that choose not to. And that is going to be such a glaring uh, uh, discrepancy. That's like, why are we wasting our time with this one boss that has a, you know, a 40% uh, uh, turnover rate in the, in, in the organization? Like, that's a waste of our money. Like, let's find somebody else. So uh, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's, it, it is a big deal. It's a growing thing. And I think it's going to continue to uh, to increase as as more research is translated to normal human communication. Something that is quite impressive is that the younger the younger generation that is joining the workforce, the Gen Zs, um, these guys, they don't take the same shit like my generation. <laughs> like we were going to work for a company for a status, for a good salary. These guys, they have finances as number four in terms of priority is more about work-life balance to self-expression the possibility to develop themselves 
And indeed, a toxic manager will not be attractive for them. And these no. guys are capable of sacrificing salary, going for lower salaries and going to a culture that is more cool, like uh, with more purpose or where they have heard that the managers are awesome or even decide I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Now I need to, to just to know a little bit of coding and then or I'm going to do social media and I'm going to be based, I don't know, in Guadalajara, in Mexico, and where it's cheaper. And then I'm going to be cool. I'm going to choose the life choice that we I didn't have yeah. in my generation because mm -hmm. I was formatted that I needed to go engineering or for studies and then to go to a reputable company that pays me well for the studies that I have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what's beautiful about it, and, and you're absolutely right, we're seeing a huge shift in, in mentality of what a career looks like, what a job looks like, uh, uh, because of, of a lot of these kind of younger generations coming up and coming through and speaking their mind. And, and I think what people don't see coming is that their influence on the broader workforce, so on their the, the Gen Z influence on millennials, the millennial influence on Gen X, the Gen X influence on boomers, and it's going to go from there, that we're going to see a lot of boomers saying, why am I busting my butt to, yeah. to do that? I want to I wanna work in Guadalajara, right? Yeah. And you see people saying, oh. I want to have, you know, I want to start a job with five weeks of vacation. I want to do something that's meaningful. And a lot of people are, are, are realizing like, oh, I don't have to be quiet anymore. I, I can say the things because other people are saying it too. And, and what we're seeing kind of broadly is people want more flexibility. I mean, the pandemic showed many folks that I don't have to commute two hours a day through stressful traffic to go to a place, right? Basically, if I can do the same job at home, if you want me to come back to the office, you're saying I need to donate two extra hours of my life, two extra hours of stress. I'm, I'm not going to get paid for that. I'm doing the same job at home or, or in an office, but now I've got to donate two hours of my life to now do it in a different location. And people are like, no, I don't want to do that. Many people, not everyone, right? But many people are saying that and like, oh, I guess I'll just try to find a job that I can work from home. Mm. Is that easy? Like, I, I would much rather take a lower salary and not have to drive two hours a day through traffic. I hate traffic. Right. And so and so you realize that the voice of the employee of, of, of younger generations all the way up is just so much more powerful in the conversation. And that is a great thing. That is a great thing, because as we mentioned earlier, culture is defined by the people in the culture. Yeah. And if more people have more voice, then we're going to get a better organizational culture just on definition. And that's something that's really exciting to me. And I think that that managers, supervisors, leaders that understand that and and lead to that and adapt to that are going to be the most successful uh, in the, into the future. Hmm. I want to shift a little bit the angle from the toxic manager to the people who are enduring the toxic manager. So what would you recommend to these people who are, I mean, suffering the day-to-day -day going with, I don't know, being Sunday evening and thinking, shit, this tomorrow is Monday. So what would you recommend to, uh, to them to, how to, on how to deal with a toxic manager? That's that's a tough, tough one, because there are so many toxic behaviors uh, that a manager can exhibit. Uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint specifically, you know, what to do to counteract all of them. However, uh, one of the things that that I recommend to folks um, to have a better relationship with work um, and all, all of the things that that can be associated with that is create very clear boundaries Right. So so what I mean by that is um, what what are you willing to do outside of work hours and be very clear, like and be true to yourself. Like I'm I'm willing to to spend probably an hour or two after hours working on email and projects. That's fine. Just identify what it is for you. Some people are like I will work no more than, you know, the, the time I'm supposed to work or whatever. Just create your, your, those boundaries um, and then hold true to those boundaries. Right, communicate those boundaries to the people around you, your your peers, your coworkers, your supervisor, anyone that works for you. Say, here are my boundaries for work. Please do not expect me to reply to an email at eleven o'clock at night. I will not be checking email at that time, right? And 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 that's fine, right? Just make that expectation known. And once you have that agreement, okay, cool. 
Um, if, if your boss says, no, I expect you to check your email at 11 o'clock at night because I'm checking my email, then, then, then maybe you have a different conversation or you start looking for another job, right? But hold true to your boundaries. Um, another thing, uh, another thing that I do, I, I recommend to folks to do is try to find the purpose and, and something that speaks to you, uh, about the work that you're doing. And in many cases, there isn't anything. So, so don't, don't feel bad if you're like, oh, there's nothing that speaks to me. But I mean, even if you have to draw a dotted line a ways back and say, well, I do this for, uh, I support this department, that department supports these people, those people support those people, and those people help get homeless people off the street or something like that, right? I don't, I don't know what it is, but f find the dotted line to a purpose that rings true to you. And then whenever you, whenever you find that, identify what things you do in a day that improve the life of those folks. Yeah. Right. And, and it doesn't have to be something like big. It doesn't have to be homeless people. Right. It could be like I uh, I help the uh, the finance department not have to rerun uh, um, uh, their reports. I don't know. Making something up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But if you identify the people that you help. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm helpful to them. Then you then document in your day. When I do this, this, this and this on time, it makes their life easier. And then every day. When you do this, 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 and this, all right, you've been successful for the day. So you actually have a very clear measure whether or not you have been successful in something that's meaningful to somebody else's life every day. And then you can talk to those people and you can get that feedback from them. And, and what it does, it gives you a little bit of purpose in this, in this kind of this, this space that you have. And that's something that's really, really powerful. The next thing I, I recommend to folks is try to get to know somebody on your team. Right. Whether whether it's, you know, up, down, left or right, it doesn't matter. But if you try to build a meaningful connection, not that they know you well, go to try to know them well. Right. Again, you're making a meaningful difference in somebody else's life. You're going to give them some purpose. And when you give someone else purpose, it gives you purpose back. So so those are things, some things that you can do in the environment, basically shielding yourself from the toxic behaviors around you. Um, and when you can do that. You're not going to have the Monday blues because you're going to look forward to doing those four things that are going to make a meaningful difference in someone's life. You're going to you're gonna, you can't wait to talk about uh, the person you're trying to get to know because you saw that their favorite uh, uh, football team uh, won their game in the World Cup or something, right? So, right. So, so you think about these things, and and you wanna you wanna create an environment around you within your control that will protect you from all that toxic behavior. It's almost like you have defined like a, a mini checkbox. So we are talking about, <laughs> are you finding purpose at uh, at work? Do you have the autonomy to decide to communicate your boundaries, how to do your job? Do you have the feeling of belonging, this connection that you do with uh, with people? Well, and if you don't have this, it's time to rethink. It's, it's mm -hmm. time to, and, but the funny thing is that we are scared about doing that, that step. Is it going to be the same in another job? If I move to another job, it, they will have the same. Or if I earn less, my family is going to quit me. I, and sorry, I know that from personal story. So this mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. that, that we manufacture in, a, in our head that we are not capable yep. of adapting our lifestyle because we are, we are having a beautiful, well-paid job and we stay in a, in a toxic environment. Toxic in a sense that it is harming your your mental health, your your well being. I mean, it doesn't have to be like it's horrible, but it's as long as it affects you, it mm -hmm. is right. Right. So, and if you don't take the boxes, then it is time to remove fears and go and take to take an action because nobody is going to pay you back the moment you are going to be really in in an area of burnout or of a, a high anxiety because you hate your Mondays. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There, uh, one of my professors from a master's program at St. Louis University, uh, Ma Matthew Grawich, uh, he wrote a, a series of papers on uh, this idea of um, kind of taking physics and overlaying that with this whole concept of work, you know, quote unquote, work life balance. And he's like, you can't really balance work and life because work is a part of life. So now you have life on both sides and you can't balance that. Right. Um, but he 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 talked about work work life home life integration, yeah. and and the, the physics part he added was this idea of of you know physics principle called the conservation of energy, 
And and basically in physics, energy doesn't just disappear, right? It go it goes somewhere. Else. We're always balancing energy across across things. And so in this context, if you have a a, a terrible experience at work, that energy or that experience flows through to other areas of your life. You come back and you have stress physically, or you have uh, strained relationships at home or whatever. Uh, If you have amazing things that happen at home, that carries through to work, right? So that energy carries through. And so when you think about all the things that, you know, people are putting up with the toxic behaviors, you know, we, we will often say like, I'm good. I'm good at managing it. I'm good at transitioning. I let that all go before I get home. But what we don't realize is how much we actually carry through with us. And and only when we are in a different environment, we're like, oh my gosh, I never believed it could be this good. And Mm -hmm. that's what a lot of people say when they transition out of a toxic environment is that I never realized it could be this good. Everything is doing better in my world. I'm happier all the time. I never realized how angry I was or frustrated I was or whatever. And so when you start to think about that, the, the fear of, you know, it might be the same or what if it's worse or I won't be able to make as much money. Like all of that is just your brain saying, stay put, stay where you are. Don't change anything because where you are is what I'm used to. And that's what we need to stick with. You have no idea how good it can be. You have no idea. I, I talked to so many people uh, who decided to change out of toxic environments and double their salary. I see uh, you know, a lot of people who change out of toxic environments and like, oh my gosh, I finally have enough time to take up the art that I wanted to take up or painting. Or people say, I finally started, uh, I got healthier because now I have the space and capacity and the physical freedom to actually go to the gym or go running or play pickleball or whatever it is. And, 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 and yes, there are situations that you're going to go into a new environment it's not as good uh, or or it's worse, but then you can make the change again, right? There's there's no rule against that. And, and that's something that I always try to encourage people to do. If you feel like there's a change that needs to be made, start taking the steps to make that change, right? Figure out, put it all down on paper. What is the worst that can happen? What is the best that can happen? And weigh those, right? And that's and that's something that can motivate you to, to take that step forward, not the fear, but rather the opportunity of what could happen. I, while you were talking, I was thinking about something that I read. I don't know where. I, I think it was this lady who talks about happiness from Yale University, Lori Santos or something like that. Um, she mentions that our brain is really, is really not good at guessing the future. So we, we always think that it's going to be better than it in reality will be or worse than it will be. So <laughs> it will never guess it right. So trust in your brain, which is mainly rational and, and influenced by emotions is not the best thing. <laughs> absolutely absolutely well and one, one thing i want to point out is like if, if you're if you're a leader and you're listening to this just know that your people are thinking about all of this right and this is not a, a new concept people are thinking about leaving right now mm-hmm. and and you have the opportunity to create the correct environment for them now right? You have the opportunity to create the context for them where they actually feel like they belong. They feel like they're making a difference. They feel like they have real connections. And those are opportunities that you can create for folks. Even if you haven't done it before, you can do that. Um, Eric, I wanted to move a little bit away from the topic because there was something that uh, I spotted in your website that made me me think, and I really liked it. Uh, so on top of working on helping organizations with having more human connection, human communication, I saw a, that you were a little bit strong in this area of inclusivity, that that was mm-hmm. something that is really anchoring your heart. So yes. tell me a little bit more of that. Why and, and what psychology brings to, in the, into the table? Absolutely. Yeah, that is that is probably the, the biggest area of our business that is growing right now. Uh, folks have been asking us to do work with diversity, equity, inclusion, privilege, uh, bias uh, for, you know, for the last, you know, even before I started the business, people were asking me to do this work. Um, and and what people don't understand about conversations about, you know, I'll just label it as diversity. Uh, what people don't understand is that 
typical diversity training has been going on for 40, 50 years right, in, in, in the United States. It's not a, it's not a new thing. And, and what we see is that in many cases, the people that go through diversity training have no change in their behavior, right? Because, because the premise of diversity training has been that you must required, say these things, do these things, behave in these ways. Otherwise you're bad, right? Do this, you're good. Don't do it. You're bad. And, and that, that binary, that either or, that good, bad judgment is something that puts a lot of people uh, in a place of resentment and defensiveness. And when people are in defensiveness, they are not actually in a place to learn anything. They're not ready or willing to take in new, maybe even challenging information. And so what we did is, is we've been you know, applying a lot of psychology research, neuroscience research, understanding like where does bias come from in the brain? Why do we have biases? And 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 change the context. So bias does not equal all of the you know racism and sexism and ages, all the isms. Bias is a, a tool that our brain uses to make sense of things faster, yeah. and then we can apply it to all those other things. But it's just, it's a tool, and so when people realize that, it's like oh, I guess it's not as bad as I thought it was. Right, now people are leaning in. And so we've actually taken you know, all of our work on human understanding and human communication and, and overlaid that with the con the concept and conversation around privilege and, and bias and all these things and discrimination. And we open people up to have deeper conversations, organizations up to having deeper conversations. And when folks engage in those conversations, now they're willing to learn more. Now they're willing to express themselves more. Now they're willing to say, I don't know. They're willing to say, I don't understand. They're willing to say, I'm sorry. And mm -hmm. those things, those are the steps that are necessary to actually have meaningful behavior change or meaningful understanding across an organization. So, so yes, absolutely. That's, that's one of the biggest things that we do. And, and the, through the lens of brain science, it, it, it fundamentally changes uh, the conversation. Can you imagine Eric? <clears throat> it is totally true that companies have been investing heavily in, in these trainings about diversity and inclusion, but they have been doing it wrong for more than 20 years. What the yes. hell? Without <laughs> practice, without acting on it, you cannot learn in a PowerPoint. That's <laughs> a, a principle. Eric, we are reaching the end, and I wanted to, uh, to ask you, so how can people reach you? Because I'm... The knowledge that you have about human psychology applied to something that is quite practical and like a, a hot potato in corporations is <laughs> impressive. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of people wants to reach you out and ask you a couple of questions. How do we reach you out? Yeah, absolutely. You can reach out through my website, ericmbailey.com. Uh, M as in Michael. So ericmbailey.com. Uh, you can reach out to me there. You can contact me, which goes directly to my email, and then I'll respond to you. Uh, we can set up a meeting if you have any questions. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, all, all, all the social medias, YouTube, etc. Uh, and if you want to grab the book, The Cure for Stupidity, you can find that at thecurefor-stupidity.com. Uh, there's some copies there for sale uh, uh, and 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 uh, and all that. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. I'm always open uh, to talk with folks. Great. I will put all of these links below the description of this episode. Thank you very much, Eric. It was really lovely and insightful to spend the, for me, the evening, for you, the morning, I guess, uh, <laughs> to talk together. So thank you very much for your time. Looking forward. All right. Thank you, Ivan.